So the other thing we'll talk about today is sequential logic. Um, so combinational logic is what we call everything we've done up till now. So combinational logic is where we have some gates connected together that do something. So you know you have bam and gate, some other gate, have them wired up. You have inputs um, and you have an output. A little messy, but oops. Um, and when you, the inputs change, the outputs changes, and that's that. That's the end of the story. Sequential logic isn't quite so straightforward because sequential logic dep does depend on the inputs, um, but it also depends on something else. It depends on the, the current state of the output. So you can think of it as having feedback. So say we have the output here. Um, you know, when you have some input C, but one of these internal inputs is somehow related to um, how that one work? You know, somehow related to the total output of the system. So something like this isn't a good example because it's not really stable per se. It'll change for a second and sort of glitch out. Um, so we need a way to store that state instead of you know something like I was showing there. Because it, the sequential logic output depends on what this state, this internal or external potentially state is. So as I said, we need a storage element. The most basic storage element you could think of is something like this, two inverters wired together. Um, again, when we had three inverters wired together, I was calling that a ring oscillator, two. It's a storage element. So if I put a zero here, one goes there, then zero goes there, and that's fine. Likewise, if there is a one at the output input here, we have zero here and one there. Um, it's not very good though because it's difficult to change the value. Um, obviously to change the value what we have to do is we sort of have to open this loop and then put the new value in and then close it again. Um, so that's as drawn not an ideal storage element. But what we will use instead is the most basic one, sort of we call this latch. Um, so this one, a reset set or RS latch, um, has two inputs. One input is called reset, R. The other input is called set for S. Um, here I built it with NOR gate, so this is a NOR gate implementation. You can also build it with NAND gates if you want, um, almost the exact same idea. So as I said, there's the two inputs, reset and set. Um, and what we'll see is that, for example, if I start with the input here of zero, so we can see how the output here is actually feeding back to the input. Um, and the two outputs are assumed to be the opposite of each other, so you can see I have Q and Q complement. Um, and they feed back internally into the circuit. So say, for example, I start with Q of zero. So if zero is here, um, R is zero, S is zero. Um, what we expect is we get a zero here, um, zero here, oops. Yeah, okay, that won't work because there's no other state. So if we have a zero here, and we actually we go to this first line where we have s equal to one, r equal to zero, um, what we will see is this zero goes here, one goes here, so the output q bar becomes one. Um, and then q, q zero, um, ah, shoot, sorry, I forgot the in fact, there are NOR gates. I was doing it as OR. Um, so if we have zero there, zero there, sets one, R is zero. Um, so this is what's drawn on the truth table. And we assume originally that Q complement is the opposite of Q, so we have one there. Um, so what we should see is that Q plus actually goes to one. Um, because we have the input of this, what is that? Yeah, okay, that's right. 
Um, and then Q bar should go to Oh, sorry, uh, yeah, yeah. No, no, so one there. One second. I had to put an error when I copied down the truth table. Um, because when s is 1, r is 0, we expect this to go to 1. Um, that's 1. It should still be 1. Zero, zero, this is one. Um, so yeah, okay, so that output would then become zero. So it changes, that's why the problem is, sorry. Um, so if we start here, we have this zero is already there. We apply a one here. Um, the output of an OR gate would be one. We complement it, we get zero. Um, the reset input is zero here. Um, and now this input is zero, so this output will become one. Uh, the output changes. That's sort of the issue with trying to write it out this way. Um, so next you could say, okay, well, if that's the state, erase this stuff. So now if I have the state of one here, um, I have a one there, and you know, again, say set is one. Um, again, the output will still, of Q complement, be zero, um, based on the truth table of the NOR gate, so we know a zero goes there, reset input is zero, um, and again, this output here is ones. Oops, that should have been zero, zero. Um, so it stays the same like that. So in this case, when we have set as one, you can see Q goes high, and then Q just stays high. Um, it doesn't matter. As long as set is high and reset is low, Q goes high. Uh, the next question is what happens if we drop set to zero? So using the exact same state everything's in here, so Q minus is one. Um, if we put a zero here, what you can see is because one of the inputs to the NOR gate is still one because of the output feedback, this output doesn't change. And the result is again, it stays the same. Uh, so the latch is keeping the value even though the set has been cleared, the value stays. Um, if we use that same state, except now what we're going to do is the S pin, if we set to, oops, the reset pin, ignore that. Say if I set the reset pin to one here. Um, or actually, I'll go through it as is to avoid. So again, if you put the set pin back to one, you can imagine it's not going to change because the set pin will go to one. Um, again, the output here will go to zero, and this stays the same. So it's still one, still zero. Um, if we clear the input again, nothing's going to happen. So you can see how this is more or less working. We have the zero here, zero goes to one. Um, so again, nothing's changing. The next question is what happens if we put the reset pin to one? Um, so we have this circuit that's in this state here. Um, set pin, we're putting to keeping at zero, and the reset pin will become one. Um, so again, the state is as before, Q plus was one here, so it becomes Q negative, that is to say the previous value of Q is one, um, and so you can see, okay, the previous value of Q is one, one goes here, zero goes here. Um, so what happens, we have this reset value of one here, one zero. Now instead, the output of this NOR gate will become zero. Um, this zero will then feed through to here and turn this into zero, um, which will then turn this Q complement output to one. 
Um, at that point, this one will feed up here, go here, and put a one at the input, but that won't matter because we have two ones at the input now. The output will stay zero. Um, so you can see Q goes to zero now, and it stays there. And Q complement goes to one and stays there. So you can see how the timing feeds through in that example. Um, again, we don't change anything. It doesn't matter because now that there's two ones there, everything's in a stable state. Um, if we remove the zero here, the state still doesn't change. Um, we still have this one input to the NOR gate, and these two in out inputs are zero. Um, because it doesn't change, it stays in this state. And uh, finally, from this state, what we can do is actually see what happens if we put S and R both to one. Um, so let's say we're in this state, and I'll erase these lines. Uh, so Q negative is zero, reset is one, set is one. Um, so what's going to happen is the output here, say we have a one here, one, one, the output would be one. Q should go to zero. Um, this zero feed through there. Zero, one, the output one. So then it goes to zero here. And then this zero feeds up and then we're in a stable state again. But the problem is that it's not valid because now Q and Q complement are actually not opposites of each other. Um, so we say this state is just an invalid state for the RS latch. Oops. Um, and this is shown here in a truth table. So we have the set input, the sort of what we call the three inputs. So Set and reset are one input, and the third input is the previous state of Q. Um, so if set and reset are zero, then the new state of Q is just the same as the old state of Q. Um, if set, if reset is one, the new state of Q is always zero. And if reset, if set is one, the new state's always one. And if both set and reset are one, we just say it's invalid. Um, because the, the new state of Q can depend on both the previous state of Q and Q complement is no longer the opposite of Q plus. So we just don't use it. Um, if you want, you can consider this using the mapping we had before to figure out what's the equation of it. Again, what we're saying here is that we have three inputs, R instead of A, B instead of S, and Q. Um, so, for example, RS0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1. And again, we're putting X's to show that we don't know or we don't really care because it's invalid. We're never going to have R and S as 1 and care what the output is. Um, so again, using the sort of K mapping stuff we did before, we could say, okay, we'll make that one, make that one, and then we'll have a group of four here and a group of two there. Um, in which case, the output Q plus will become, what's this, R? This is uh, sum of product form. Yep, sum of product form, so. Uh, if we, yeah, if you wanted to use product of sums, you'd take the zeros. And in which case, you could make these x's zeros to make that as big. So when you have the x's, you won't necessarily, you know, result in the same implementation. You'll only have the same implementation in sum of product and product of sum if you take the x's to be the same value. Right? Um, yeah. Is um, yeah, I mean, we will use some of products more of the time. When you're doing the design, normally it is, because, for example, if you're using the PAL type devices or even CPLDs, they're designed to only use 
sell of products. You just have no choice in the matter. Um, if you were designing your whole own thing, you could do it depending which way resulted in simpler implementation. Um, a, B, so yeah, and then you have. Um, and anyway, and you could go through this as before um, and sort of design the whole output equation for the ARIS flip flop. What we'll do with the RS flip-flop is add additional inputs. Um, so this is the same RS flip-flop idea as before, um, except I have three inputs to the OR gate here instead of just the two inputs. So we had this three input, two input OR gates here. Here I have three input OR gate. Um, and we'll have a reset input in addition to what I call preset or set, same thing. Um, and these two inputs you can always use in the same way. So if you set R reset to high and, and set to low, the output goes to zero. Um, but we also add some inputs with an enable pin here. Um, so we have these AND gates added. And what these do is that the external inputs here Um, these external RS inputs are only taken into account when the E pin is high. So if the E pin is low, the enable pin is low, um, the output is just sort of held at the same state. Um, because when this, if E is equal to zero, obviously this output goes to zero, this output goes to zero. As we saw before for zero, zero, um, assuming the reset and preset aren't used, the output stays the same. Where we have something like the reset and preset is that, for example, if you're designing a big system with a whole bunch of flip-flops, uh, you might use the reset pin to set everything to a specific state all at once, um, regardless of what you're using the enable pin for. And a way of avoiding the um, sort of that ambiguity I showed before where this R and S pin if they're both set to one, this is very bad. Bad things happen. Uh, and we don't want that. So one way we can avoid that is we can add a not gate here. Um, like that. Or even better, you can add a not gate like this. And the reason we prefer this way is that the pins are guaranteed to never be the same. Um, and if, say, I put a 1 here, what happens is that that 1 will be fed into the set pin. The reset pin will be low. The output will go to 1. Um, if we put a 0 here, The set pin goes low, reset pin goes high, and the output goes to zero. So at this point in time, that seems kind of useless because it's just following the input. Exactly. Um, and this is where the enable pin comes in. So the enable pin, if you set this to some state, so say we set it to zero, um, with the enable pin equal to one. If you then set the enable pin low, it remembers that state, regardless of what happens uh, at this input here. Because the enable pin is zero, the input here is always zero, zero. It doesn't matter. Um, so as an example, we draw this whole thing, we encompass it within um, this block. So we have Q input, Q output. So we have D for data, um, which is here. This is D. And then we have E for enable. So say you had something like that going on the enable pin. Um, and then all you have to do is when the enable pin is high, you put the data you want on the output. So we have something like that. Um, and then you could go low. And then maybe you want it to go low again. Um, so what you would have here at the output Q is that at this point in time, it is following the output. So the output will go high. Um, but then once the enable pin goes low, it's just going to keep the same value. So it actually will just keep it for a little while. Until the enable pin goes high again, 
and then it'll go low. Um, so to draw this two over top of each other, something like that. Um, so the advantage of this is that you might have data that's changing, you know, at some point in time, like somebody's entering something, so they enter some data, and then you set the enable pin high to say data is ready, load it in. Then you set the enable pin low, you can change the data around, and the whatever, the computer, the system just ignores the changing inputs. Um, we can extend that even further, in this case, to what we call D-type flip-flop, so not just the latch. When we had a latch, as long as the enable pin was high, the output was following the input. Um, if we combine them together like this, what you see is that, for example, if I put a 1 here and a 0 here, what you'll have is this goes to 1, the enable pin, so then this gets forwarded, so a 1 pin goes here. But this enable is 0, so the output is still the old value. Um, what you have to do is then set this pin to 1. So if we then change that pin to 1, this goes to 0, and this goes to 1. At this point in time, this data is then forwarded onward um, to the output Q. But because this one is disabled at 0, um, it doesn't matter what happens to the input because, you know, if the input changes, this is still going to stay a, a 1, which is being forwarded to the output. Um, so the flip-flops are handy because they only change right at the edge. So here the problem was that the whole time this enable pin is high, the data is being forwarded. So you have to keep the data constant this whole time. Um, with the D-type flip-flop, if I have a clock in here, so say I had this. Um, when the clock was low here, and say we had D, for this whole time here, the data is being forwarded to this intermediate point. Um, and then when the clock is high, it's then forwarded onward. The effect of this is that basically whatever happens here at the clock edge is the data that's captured. Um, to the output. So w at this clock edge, that's where we're switching from this data was being captured up to this point, so this whole clock time here, data was being forwarded to here. When that clock goes high, this flip-flop stops uh, forwarding the data, it latches, or that latch, sorry, it latches the data, um, and the second latch here then loads the data to the output. When that clock goes low again, this guy stops doing that. It latches the data, keeps it in a constant value. Um, so the flip-flops get the data just on the, the edge of that clock input. So we'll use a symbol like this, um, where this triangle means edge sensitive. So on the clock edge, the flip-flop is capturing the data. Um, in this example, on the rising edge, whatever data, so even if you have something like this, what the output will do is it'll go high and stay high until the next clock edge. Um, for this example here, where we have the inversion symbol, this means that on the falling clock edge, the data is being captured instead of the rising. So that's just the notation we'll be using is that if it's just a triangle like that, it means rising edge sensitive, as in whatever data is on the input at that point gets captured. Um, this falling edge means whatever data is at the input on that point in time gets captured. So we have rising and falling edge triggered flip-flops. Um, when we talk about timing in the flip-flop, so here's an example of we have the clock, the data, and the output Q. Um, there's a few considerations for the use of the flip-flop. One of them is what happens to the timing and how it matters. So um, here we have, for example, I've said on the rising edge here, 
the data is being forwarded to the output. So this data, which is high, goes to the output. Now, obviously, there's an actual delay in how long that takes. Um, so this is one thing. We have this, this data delay. Um, another consideration you'll have is that the data itself, before the clock edge, as I showed before, when we design a lap, when we design a flip flop, we're actually using two latches. So for the time the clock is low, it's being forwarded by one latch. By the time the clock is high, the second latch takes over. Um, for this to work, the data actually has to arrive before the rising clock edge. So before that point. This point here in green, um, the data actually has to be valid beforehand, which we call the setup time. So there's some minimum, you know, the data has to, there's a setup time of two nanoseconds. Two nanoseconds before the clock edge, the data must already be, has changed, have been there. Likewise, after the clock changes, um, there's this second amount of time that you can't change it. Even though the clock edge has occurred, um, you have to keep that data in a constant value. Um, and again, it comes down to the fact that this second flip-flop will be taking over, and this guy will be disabled. But say if we have this inverter here, what happens is there's a tiny bit of delay before that first <coughs> latch has started to latch the data. So if you change the data too soon after the clock edge, um, it may actually get forwarded incorrectly, and so you'll have the, the wrong output that you don't expect. And that we call the hold time. So the setup time is before the clock edge, the hold time is after. Um, and then there's obviously also some delay between when the data finally makes it to the output of the whole system. Uh, there will also be some minimum clock frequency, so you need a, at least this wide to be able to get the data through the latches. Um, so one of the most important flip-flops we'll be using is the actual this JK flip-flop. So again, flip-flop means that we have this edge-sensitive property of it. So when we talk about a latch, the RS latch, um, oops, RS latch, that meant that it was not edge sensitive. There, we might have had an enable pin um, here, but as long as the enable pin was high, we could still change the output. With a latch, like a JK, or with a flip-flop, sorry, like a JK flip-flop, um, the output may only be valid when this clock, or the output, the output only changes on the clock edge. Um, so on the clock edge, we could sample the J and the K values. And then it doesn't matter after that what happens. So we'll have a truth table of it shown here. Um, and again, this truth table isn't showing the clock. It's just saying what is the value of J and K on the clock edge. And then this is the result. So in a very, very similar to the RS flip-flop, um, if J and K are zero, the output just remains the same. So if the previous output was zero, the new output becomes zero. Um, if K goes to one, the output always goes to zero. So K is as if it's a reset. Um, in a similar way, J is like the set pin because if J is one, um, the output always goes to 1. The difference between the JK and the RS is that if J and K are both 1, um, the output toggles. So if it was 0, it becomes 1. If it was 1, it becomes 0. Um, so that's the difference between the main difference, the JK and the RS, is that we have this additional property that if both of the inputs are 1, um, the output just toggles between the two values. So if you tie J and K to 1 and put in a clock pulse, all you'll have is the input just goes 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. Um, and in a similar way, I won't go through the whole example, but we could map this again using instead of A and B, J and K. 
K and an output Q. Um, and from that, you can create equations of the JK flip-flop, and I'll probably go through that Monday a bit. Um, as I mentioned, so if we connect these together, uh, we can create the toggle flip-flop or the T flip-flop. So we have T and then clock in. So we could redraw this just like this. So when the input T Um, is one, that flip-flop will be toggling the output. And where we'll use the toggle uh, flip-flop is you can actually use it to do stuff like divide clocks or we'll show later making counters. So for example, um, say I had a clock like that. Um, again, if I have a toggle input, a toggle flip-flop, or which you can make from a JK, I tie this to VCC, that is J and K are both one, um, and then I apply this clock here, so we have a clock input. Um, you can say, well, what will the output Q be? And the answer is that on every clock edge, the output Q toggles, so clock edge being here, here, and here. So say it was initially zero, at this clock edge it goes to one. At this clock edge, it goes down to zero and up to one. Um, so in that way, you can see how we can use this as a frequency divider because the input frequency um, has this, or the input has this period here, you know, period T, and frequency is just one over this period. Um, but the output, you can see, because it's toggling at every rising edge, um, Has a double, has a period of twice that of the input. So the frequency is half. And you can chain a bunch of them together if you want to divide by, you know, two, four, eight, etc. Each time it just divides the next stage by half of it. So, brief summary. Um, So I talked a bit about programmable logic. Programmable logic just being a way of implementing designs in a single chip. So rather than wiring up tons of AND and OR gates as we were doing in the or that first lab where you saw AND and OR gates, um, we can just take one chip which implements this array of logic we can program. And this array of logic Initially, um, what they were doing is you have a bunch of AND gates, and you can select what are the inputs to the AND gates, and then they just get ORed together, and that's your output. So, you know, if you had A, B, C, D, and you had F equals A and B and C plus A and C complement, so if that was your output F, using this device, what you would do is you would say, okay, well, what I know I need is I need inputs A, connected, I need B, I need C, and I don't use D, so we disconnect that, and I don't use any of the co other complements. Um, so this term here then becomes A and B and C. Um, the other input it depends on is A, and I don't use A complement, I don't use B, I don't use B complement, I don't use C, and I use C complement, I don't use D or D complement, and then this term becomes A and C complement. Um, likewise, here we have these additional two products, so all of those get X out. So this was sort of the initial stages of programmable logic, um, what we would call the PAL devices. So very similar, we do the design using this sum of products idea, and then you implement it in the device. Um, the next step to that was complex programmable logic devices, and you can think of these like each of these macro cells is like one PAL device, and you know they add a few e features in, um, but there's one bunch of these PAL-like devices, so you can have a bunch of different product terms added, um, as well as some switchable interconnect as a way of interconnecting those PAL-like devices. 
So you can implement different functions within a macro cell. So, you know, one product term you could do in this one, maybe some others in the next macro cell, and then combine them together to create your whole design. Um, a more, I wouldn't say more flexible version, but a version that scales better is field programmable gate arrays, or FPGAs. And in FPGAs, we have, um, again, this programmable logic block that is implemented a little differently. I won't go into details, but the main difference is, is that it's placed almost in what you can think of like a mesh of programmable interconnects. So each of these is programmable interconnects. Um, so those programmable interconnects let you decide how everything is selected. So, you know, how does this block connect here? Signals from this one going elsewhere. Um, and you, these can be huge. You can have, you know, millions of gates in however many thousands and thousands of these blocks all connected together. Um, so FPGAs can get quite a bit larger than complex programmable logic, right, the CPLDs. And they all, both of these started around 84, 85, more or less. Um, what we'll be using in class is, again, CPLDs. Um, and we'll be using this board that has one on it. You can program it. The architecture is from around 96. And the ones we're using have about 800 usable gates. Um, to give you an idea, this is what those macro cells that I talked about look like in each CPLD. So you have these product terms that you can add, to, add together so you can choose which of them get connected to an OR gate. And, you know, you, there is, as I said, some additional logic to do even more features here. So we have some of those flip-flops I talked about. Um, so they add a little more flexibility to your design. And to design them, you can just drop down a schematic like we've been doing. Um, and the schematic software does have these blocks that are other things. So here I have a decoder. Um, here I have a counter. And you can just drop those down and it'll sort of map those into the macro cell. So it you know, will map them as needed to create the design for you. Um, Summary of sequential logic design. So everything up to now has been combinational logic, which doesn't depend on the state. Sequential logic depends on the state is the difference. Obviously, we need a way to store the state. So we had this idea we could make storage elements with two not gates. Um, not so convenient because it's hard to change the state. So we use latches. Those are the better systems um, where we have a reset and a set input. And when the reset input is 1 and set in input is 0, the output should go to 0. Um, so, for example, if we have a 1 here and say this was 0, or say it was 1 to start with, and this was 0. Um, so we have 0 here, 1 here. So if we put a 1 here, we know from the equation of the NOR um, that this will actually go to 0. Then this gets forwarded here. The 0 goes here. And 0, 0 input to the NOR gives us a 1 output. And this 1 now goes to here. And again, 1, 1, we still get 0. So now it's fine. If we take away that, our input, the zero, we put a 0 here, um, what happens is we still have a 1 here and a 0 here, so the output doesn't change. It's now latched the state, and it's a steady state. It's sort of stable at this point. In a similar way, if you set the set input to 1, um, again, you know, if this was 0, 1, 0, set input to 1 here, 0 goes there, 1 goes there, um, what you'll get is that this would go to 0, forward up to here to 0, and this would become 1. Um, and again, and then this 1 would come down here, and that becomes 1. Again, now if you remove the set, it's fine. It's in a latch state. Um, so the RS latch is the most basic form of this. We'll add some additional inputs frequently. One of them is what we'll call these asynchronous. Um, that is to say you can just change them at any point. Reset and set input. 
But more importantly for right now, what we'll add is this enable pin. Um, and the enable pin means that we only pay attention to the inputs when the enable is one. So if the enable is zero, it just latches it. It doesn't do anything. Um, and we'll make a data latch by just adding a not gate. So if the input goes to one, zero. Um, and the data latch means that we avoid this problem I had mentioned before, where if R and S are both one, the output's not anything good. Um, so that's the symbol for it. We make a flip-flop using two latches. Um, and the reason we do this is that, for example, if we clock goes low, then high, then low, um, at this point, we'll have the opposite because we have an inverter. And this is the same. So what you have is, say, if the data is 1, while the clock is low, this first flip-flop is enabled, and the data gets transferred to this point. Um, while this flip, while this latch, not flip up, while this latch is enabled, the second one is not enabled. So it does not store the new data. Um, when the clock goes high, this latch, the enable pin goes low because of the inverter, and it means that this latch now is just storing the data. Um, so the one is here, it doesn't matter. If this goes to zero, nothing happens because that first latch is just storing the current state. Um, but this latch now forwards this state here um, because it is enabled. The clock is high, so the E, e pin is high here. Um, and the result is that now the, the output now represents what was at the input here um, right before the clock went high. Um, because once the clock was high, this guy stops forwarding any new data. So what you're doing, basically, is that you're allowing yourself just this short window when the data needs to change. The rest of the time, the data can change as much as you want. So at this point in time, right at the clock edges, um, the data gets forwarded. So if you know the data was 1 here and then 0... And then if it's one again on the clock edges, um, what you'll see at the output here is that it'll go high with that first clock, um, and it'll just stay high, because each of the times when it's sampling it, it's been high. So with the flip-flops, it's all about the clock edges. It's solely the data. All that matters is the data at the edges. Um, and it can either be the rising edge, the positive edge, or, as in here, the negative edge. So in this case, all that matters is this point here, the falling or the negative edge. Um, so at that point, when the data goes low, when the clock goes low, whatever the value of the data is gets forwarded on. When we deal with the timing, you have to remember that the probably two most critical ones are the idea, okay, so here, I've said, is the clock edge. This is what's important. Before that clock edge occurs, you need to have the data already be valid. So this is what we call the setup time. Um, so before the clock edge, you have to have the data input no longer changing. So it's reached, it's reached the value we, we want, at least that setup time before it. Likewise, after the clock edge changes, we have this hold time. So for some amount of time after the clock edge changes, you cannot change the input data, or you risk effectively corrupting it, or some unintended results can happen. Um, so those two considerations are one of the most important points when we deal with flip-flop circuits for the timing. Uh, the JK flip-flop, again, flip-flop meaning it has a clock input, and the clock input is edge-sensitive, um, is one of the most common, especially that we'll use a little bit in this class. So the JK flip-flop solves the problem of, um, for the RS latch, we had the problem that if it's 1-1, one, one, it's just bad. The outputs are no longer valid. 
Um, so for the JK flip-flop, it's similar. It's like the RS in that this is like the res oops, like the set input. This is like the reset input. Um, except when both inputs are one, the output actually toggles. So we can see when both inputs are one, if the previous state was zero, the new state's one, and vice versa. Um, for this flip-flop, the or for this truth table, what you have to remember is I'm saying this is the value of J and K on the clock edge. So when the clock was rising, in this example, J was zero, K was zero. Thus, um, the value of Q before the clock rose and Q after the clock rises, so the new value, changes as such. So this is four clock edge. And then this one is as if it's after the clock edge. Um, and so you can see from this truth table how they're changing. Again, you can map the equations if you want. Go through those, I think, Monday probably. Um, so, and another basic flip-flop we'll build from the JK is the toggle flip-flop where we only consider that J and K might be tied together. So. It has an input T that, if it's high, it means um, J and K are one, thus the output toggles. If it's low, the inputs just stay the same. And we'll use this frequently for stuff like counters and clock dividers that game we'll talk later on about. Um, if you want more information, the, that, the textbook, the Bebop to the Boolean Boogie, chapter 11, goes through a lot of this in good detail with some good examples as well.